Welcome to Froome, one of the most charming towns in all of Somerset, and regularly ranked as one of the best places to live in Britain. A historic centre of the local wool trade, Froome today is a bustling little market town filled with shops, historic landmarks and some of the most beautiful streets in the country, which wind their way up through the immensely hilly town centre. We'll make our way into the higgledy-piggledy heart of Froome in a few minutes, but we begin on the edge of the town centre on the bridge over the River Froome, which as I'm sure you can guess, lends its name to the town. Though you won't find any water-powered mills in the modern-day town of Froome, its namesake river remains a popular spot for other reasons, particularly here as it flows underneath Froome Bridge, an unusual bridge in the fact that it has shops built on top of it, one of only three in the UK to do so, alongside the Pulteney Bridge in nearby Bath and the High Bridge up in Lincoln. From the bridge, however, we're now looking up the road towards the Town Heritage Museum housed within a striking building dating from the 1860s, when it was originally opened as a library and scientific institute. Now a museum, the building is home to a vast collection of items chronicling the history of Froome. But before we get into exploring the town's illustrious history in detail, let's first take a look at a map of the region to get a better idea of exactly where this town is. As you can see, Froome is located in the county of Somerset in southwest England, the town located roughly 10 miles to the south of Bath and 14 miles to the east of the cathedral city of Wells. Froome here, as a busy market town, acts as a regional centre for the east of Somerset County and communities just across the border in Wiltshire. But people come from much further afield to visit this town and its many beautiful, intriguing sites, one of which we find here on the other side of Froome Bridge. This is the Blue House, which despite its name is built of beautiful cream-coloured stone. Built in 1726, the Blue House's name actually comes from the fact that it was the town's Blue Coat School, a type of charity school for poorer children, whose uniform consisted of blue coats. The school closed in 1921, but before it, the site on which the Blue House now stands was originally home to an arms house, built in the late 15th century and which was used as a place to give shelter and aid to the poorest people in Froome. Nowadays, the Blue House, which actually stands on a small island beside the river, has returned to its roots, now home to a number of flats designed to cater to elderly members of the local community. But having now made our way off Froome Bridge, we find ourselves on the main street leading into the centre of town, and Froome's marketplace. Situated on a low-lying piece of ground beside the river, the marketplace is certainly one of the flatter areas of Froome's hilly town centre, which we'll see up close in a few moments. And so the level ground here made this an ideal place to establish many large town institutions, including pubs like the Blue Boar across the road from us here, which dates back to the 17th century. Historically, there was no short supply of pubs to be found in Froome's town centre, the Blue Boar, numbered as just one of 43 that existed in the town back in 1774, although that count has decreased somewhat over time, Froome today home to around a dozen pubs in the heart of town. That's still a fair amount, however, for a town of around 30,000 people in the 21st century. So why is it that Froome here has always been a place busy with drinking spots? Well, of course, Froome's pubs, taverns and inns weren't all simply places where you could go and get a pint. Many made a business as temporary lodgings for visitors passing through the town, while some of the town's largest and oldest inns were used for much more. For example, across the road from us here, there stands the George Hotel in White, which was built back in 1650. And over the course of three centuries, it served as the central venue in Froome's social and commercial sphere, hosting lavish balls, conferences and more, and today still serving as one of the most convenient places to stay in the town centre. Nowadays you might come to stay in Froome to do a bit of tourism, but once upon a time it was mostly those involved in trade who would stop in Froome, either coming to buy or sell goods at the town's historic market, which took place around this spot. Froome has been home to a weekly market for the best part of a thousand years, making its market one of the oldest in England. 
and here just in front of us, there stands the Boyle Cross, a relatively young landmark dating back to 1871. Acting as the town's market cross, the Boyle Cross stands at the heart of the local marketplace, which was historically divided into two, an upper and lower market, the lower being closer to the river. The upper and lower market sold different goods, although since the marketplace was redeveloped in the Georgian era around 300 years ago, the modern market is now home to a delightful variety of products from stall to stall, still taking place in Froome every Wednesday on the nearby market yard. But there's no need to fret if you aren't in Froome on a Wednesday, because just off the marketplace you'll find one of the town's most beautiful and most varied shopping streets, Cheap Street. Winding its way around the contours of the hills at the heart of town, Cheap Street today is lined with an eclectic range of independent shops, cafes, salons and more, although it's not designed as a place to find bargains as the name may suggest. In fact, the cheap in Cheap Street comes from the Old English word chap, which roughly refers to the selling of goods, or more generally, a market. And with the many shops that still exist on Cheap Street, that name rings true even today. Cheap Street, which links the marketplace with the parish church of St John, was originally built as a venue for the growing market in medieval Froome. Nowadays, the majority of the buildings that we see lining Cheap Street date from around the 16th century, but while the shops inside are certainly worth popping into, there's something in the middle of the street that you should also watch out for. Looking down at the pavement, we can see a roughly foot-wide gully flowing through the middle of Cheap Street. It's one of the street's most famous features, and although it seems almost unthinkable by modern health and safety standards, this gully, or to call it by its proper name, this leet, is a rare surviving example of a typical medieval gutter. Unlike today, when pipes are hidden underground, in the medieval era, leets just like this were open to the air as they flowed along major streets. Cheap Street's Leet specifically was originally designed to bring water from a stream just beneath St John's Church into the town, but as you can imagine, the presence of people around the Leet made it far from the most sanitary supply of water, as locals would throw their rubbish or even urinate into the waterway. Nowadays, having been continuously flowing for hundreds of years, the water quality in the Leet has been cleaned up, and so you only have to worry about wet socks if you accidentally put your foot in the wrong place. The local shops do use advertising boards to warn you of where the water is running as you walk up Cheap Street. We'll see the source of the intriguing leet when we visit the parish church in a couple of moments, but we must quickly mention the distinctly Froome-esque shopping that you can expect when strolling along Cheap Street. In recent years, Froome has been ranked as one of the coolest and quirkiest towns in Britain, and the shops on Cheap Street are a great example of that home to popular artisan bakeries like the Old Bakehouse, a collection of independent cafes, and a variety of locally run shops selling books, clothes, jewellery, records, handmade goods, and everything in between. At the top of Cheap Street, meanwhile, we find the historic Three Swans pub, which dates back to the 17th century and is home to one of the most charming interiors of any pub in Froome, while beside it is yet another independent bookstore. And it's this collection of picturesque historic buildings, alongside thriving local businesses, that really stands as a symbol of Froome in the modern day, a charismatic and offbeat town that's full of life. And that's not even mentioning the town's immense beauty, surrounded by lush countryside and home to delightful views like the one here looking down Cheap Street, which is punctuated at this end by an eye-catching black and white timber-framed house that's now home to a cafe. But while Cheap Street is now a quirky shopper's paradise, we mentioned that the street was originally designed to link the marketplace with the parish church of St John, and at the foot of the church we find the source of the famous Leet that runs all the way down Cheap Street. This is the Lion Fountain, and although it does indeed still provide the water that runs down through the middle of Cheap Street, this watering hole has actually played an even greater role in the history of Froome as a whole. The fountain is built on top of a natural spring that's now located underneath St John's Church. But all the way back in the Saxon era, this spring was regarded as a holy place. 
with its sacred credentials, a place of worship, was therefore founded atop the spring in the year 685 AD, and St John's, established on the same site a few centuries later, continues that tradition to this day. The water from this spring, flowing down into the River Froome, helped to establish this area as a place of major settlement, and although the hilly terrain may have seemed like a difficult place to build a growing town, things proved quite the opposite, as Froome went from strength to strength to become one of the largest towns in the region. We'll talk more about how that unfolded later on, but here we find ourselves looking up at St John's Church, Froome's beautiful parish church that was originally built just over 800 years ago in the late 12th century. As we mentioned, it was this church which replaced the original Saxon chapel and monastery of the 7th century, and as the town of Froome has grown, so too has St John's here, having evolved from a much smaller 12th century Norman church to become the imposing Gothic building that we see today by the mid-15th century. Today, it's not only the building of St John's Church which is worth viewing, but also the churchyard surrounding it, most notably on this north side looking down the hill. Sloping down from the church, we can see a staircase known as the Via Crucis, a unique feature of St John's that features a series of carvings depicting Jesus' journey to the cross as told in the Bible. The Via Crucis, a rather more elaborate part of the churchyard, was built in the 19th century as part of a sprawling restoration of the parish church. Still standing tall as we climb further up towards the peak of Froome's hilly town centre, St John's Church remains an iconic site of the modern town, and as well as its beautiful exterior and splendid churchyard, you can also venture inside the church and view its fetching wooden beamed ceiling, as well as stone relics dating back to the original Saxon chapel. But on the northwest corner of the parish church, you'll find the pleasantly named Gentle Street, another of Froome's most eye-catching streets which climbs yet further up the hill. A picturesque cobbled lane, Gentle Street's name has nothing to do with its gradient, but rather the Gentle family, who used to live here a couple of centuries ago. Before them, however, Gentle Street was known by the rather more gruesome sounding name, Hunger Lane, so called in reference to its steepness requiring such exertion to climb that it would drive anybody to hunger. Gentle Street today is a steep but beautiful narrow lane lined mostly with houses of the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, but the road's origins are closely linked to the church that stands beside it, and the men who founded the first place of worship here over 1300 years ago. As we get a closer look at the exterior of St John's Church and its towering spire, we know that the original chapel and monastery that existed here back in the 7th century was founded by the saint Oldhelm, and what is now Gentle Street served as one of Oldhelm's main entry points into the nascent town of Froome. Situated higher up above much of the surrounding terrain, Gentle Street then became the site of a lookout post for those who'd settled around the spring beneath the ground here, which over the centuries was built and built upon, now lying deep below our feet. Here to the south side of the church building, meanwhile, is a small extension to the churchyard, in which there stands this grand memorial to none other than W. J. E. Bennett, who served as the parish vicar for 34 years in the 19th century. Bennett, who was actually born over in Canada, was a major religious campaigner for theological reforms in the Church of England in the 19th century, and served as a leading member of clergymen known as the Oxford Group. Here in Froome, meanwhile, Bennett brought greater equality to religious worship among the townspeople, and championed the establishment of schools for the children of local factory workers. Strolling back down Gentle Street, the surroundings of St John's Church really bring you back to the earliest origins of the town of Froome, although it's entirely possible that there was permanent settlement here even before the 7th century. The surrounding countryside has seen multiple remains of Roman settlement unearthed, and just 12 years ago in 2010, a huge hoard of over 52,000 Roman coins was found just over a mile away from where we are now, the Froome Hoard lending credence to the notion of a Roman population having lived in or around this area. However, the town of Froome that we know today almost certainly started right here where St John's Church is located and the church is accessed from the streets of the town centre by this rather impressive gateway. 
As we mentioned, the church was refurbished and expanded significantly in the 19th century, and these gates, built in 1814, were designed as a monumental entrance to the grand forecourt, now a car park, in front of the church, where public assemblies and other such events could take place. Prior to the opening of this entrance, it was typically via the staircase or gentle street that locals made their way to St John's Church for worship. But in the early 19th century, this road, known as Bath Street, was laid out sloping steeply down the hill as a new main street through the town centre. With the advent of longer distance travel and more traffic as the Industrial Revolution had got underway, Gentle Street was therefore overtaken by the new Bath Street here as the main entrance into Froome from the south. But despite its relative modernity, there was no overcoming the steep terrain on which the town of Froome is situated. From where we started by the river, we've already climbed a fair amount, and we haven't even reached the top of the town yet, where we'll be finishing our walk in just over 10 minutes time by the Town Hall and Christchurch. We're still yet to make our way up Catherine Hill one of the steepest and certainly most beautiful streets in Froome. But having made our way across Bath Street, we're now passing by the Old Bath Arms, another town centre pub which is housed in a 19th century building, part of which was historically the site of a busy iron foundry and gas works. That might not sound so exciting at first, but the factory belonged to Edward Cockey, a pioneer of the gas industry who brought gas lighting to Froome in 1831, and whose foundry here provided an important new source of employment for the people of this town, as the traditional wool industry was facing a premature decline. As with many other towns around this region, the production of woolen cloth and textiles was big business in Froome ever since the medieval era, mills powered by the river Froome also driving the town's economy for centuries and providing jobs for those who lived here. With its thriving market and prosperous wool trade, Froome rose to become one of the largest towns in Somerset for around 700 years, larger even than Bath. But the advent of the Industrial Revolution actually spelt the end of the traditional local wool trade. Poor investment in local factories and workshops meant that the quality of cloth produced in Froome was far below what could be found in other nearby towns. By the early 19th century, Froome was actually facing industrial decline, while the rest of the UK experienced immense growth as the Industrial Revolution reached its peak. But over the course of that century, efforts were made to stem the town's decline and reinvigorate it to its former glory as one of Somerset's great towns. We'll talk about how exactly that revival project unfolded shortly, but here we find ourselves at the top of Stony Street, which leads back down to the marketplace and which is characteristically lined with stony cobbles. While we walked off earlier down Cheap Street from the marketplace, following Stony Street will bring you up here to a network of narrow and especially steep cobbled streets that make up an area known as St Catherine's, today best known as Froome's Artisan Quarter. Filled with the quirkiest independent shops in a town filled to the brim with them, the centrepiece of St Catherine's is without doubt this street, the beautiful, spectacularly steep and gently winding Catherine Hill. Rising dramatically from near the marketplace to the top of the town, Catherine Hill here regularly features on lists of the UK's most picturesque streets, not only for its enchanting cobbles and sweeping profile, but also for the wide array of intriguing shops that you'll find along it. Most of the shops you'll find on Catherine Hill sell clothes of a variety of styles, and we'll take a closer look inside the shop windows when we get a little further up the hill. But who is this Catherine that the street and artisan quarter's names are referring to? Well, specifically, the names refer to a historic shrine dedicated to St Catherine, which existed somewhere in this part of Froome, although there's no certain evidence of the shrine's exact location. The name, however, has endured through the centuries to become associated with this picturesque and characterful part of the town centre. But as we look back down Catherine Hill, we can see that the street is at this point joined on the right by Paul Street, a higher level walkway that travels straight from near the Old Bath Arms where we were a few minutes ago, without dipping down and back up again, as in the route we've just walked. It's a useful cut through if your legs are feeling a bit tired from a walk around Froome. Believe me, at this point of our tour, I'd fancy a brief sit-down. 
But let's press on further up Catherine Hill, because we're not all that far away from the very top of the town now. The steepness of Froome's streets, particularly in the quarter of St Catharines, is simply the result of them having been the main roads down towards the river in this higgledy-piggledy part of countryside known as the Mendip Hills, and while the modern town of Froome has evolved with more modern and slightly less steep roads elsewhere, the likes of Catherine Hill remain an example of the original medieval street pattern still intact. That being said, the true Mendip Hills further to the west of Froome are even steeper. But having made our way past the many shops of Catherine Hill now, we find something a little different, a gateway engraved with the words Zion Congregational Church. Established in 1810, the Zion Congregational Church was formed by a group of locals as a breakaway from the nearby Rook Lane Chapel, a historic non-conformist chapel back on Bath Street. The two chapels later reunited, and the Old Zion Congregational is now home to a community centre, standing as one of a number of intriguing buildings that you'll find if you venture off Catherine Hill. We'll be doing just that in a couple of minutes when we make our way off this steep street into a maze of more modern streets built during Froome's Industrial Revival. But before we do that, we must just continue a little further up to the top of Catherine Hill, where we'll find an enchanting local landmark. Amazingly, despite its cobbles and narrow, steep profile, cars still drive up Catherine Hill every day. So do watch out for anything coming up behind you if you're taking a leisurely stroll up the hill while looking in the shop windows. At the top of the hill, the cobbles eventually stop and Catherine Hill becomes Catherine Street, part of the original main road that enters Froome from the west. Where horses and carriages bringing people and goods once descended down towards Froome's marketplace, you'll now find a relatively quieter road that winds its way from the outskirts to the heart of town. But as well as that, Catherine Street here is also where you'll find that fetching local landmark that we briefly mentioned. Tucked away in a colourful street corner, this is the Valentine Lamp, a traditional gas-lit street lamp that exists as the last of its kind standing in all of Somerset. A romantic local landmark, the glow of the gas lamp creates an oasis of light here at the top of Catherine Hill during the evening, while the lamp post, painted with roses, is also adorned with an original George V era post box, a good place for lovebirds to send off Valentine's cards. Since it was renovated in 1995, the Valentine Lamp has also been the site of a traditional lighting ceremony on the 14th of February each year, as a man by the name of Reg Ling, who devised the lamp's original renovation, sets off a rocket above Froome, summoning the townspeople to the lamp. Half an hour later at 6pm, Reg lights the lamp using a traditional lighting stick like those used back when gaslighting was widespread to ripples of applause from the locals who gather here at the top of Catherine Hill. It's a lovely little local ceremony that brings yet more character to this effortlessly lovable town. But we now need to make our way away from the Valentine Lamp and briefly back down Catherine Hill. That's because here, just off the iconic cobbled street, we find an opening between the shops, leading to a street known as Shepherd's Barton. Though now open for pedestrians to walk through, Back in the 17th century, this building was the home of John Shepherd, a humble cardboard maker who went on to establish the modern cloth trade in Froome, which as we know, dominated local industry until the early 19th century. Over the course of 200 years, the Shepherd family drove the modernisation and mechanisation of the traditional manufacture of textiles in Froome, existing as the largest employer of locals up until the decline of the wool industry. Nowadays, the Shepherd name is another that you'll find in a number of places around Froome. The quaint street here that's known as Shepherd's Barton, for example, referring to the site of a farmyard that belonged to the family. A site that, interestingly, may have been the site of the medieval shrine to St Catherine, which as we know, lent its name to Froome's modern artisan quarter. Here at the top of Shepherd's Barton, you'll also find an impressive old house known as the Old Manse, built back in the late 18th century when this area of Froome was a little more rural than what we see today. As we mentioned, the Barton in Shepherd's Barton points to the existence of an old farmyard, 
and this area of town, situated on a higher and flatter piece of ground than the hilly caverns around St Catharines and Cheap Street, was likely a good place for agriculture centuries ago. However, as Froome grew in size in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries, this part of town soon became the home of a busy network of streets, where those working in the town's many factories lived. Here we find ourselves on Wine Street, a narrow residential road which was laid out in the early 18th century, and is home to some of the oldest workers' houses in town, serving as a rare example of pre-Victorian industrial housing that was once commonplace across England. These roads spread out further around the higher ground that looms above the historic heart of Froome, the nearby Trinity area having comprised the majority of industrial houses for centuries, before slum clearance orders in the 1960s led to the demolition of about half of these historic streets. Still, Wine Street here remains in existence, and joining it at this junction is a road known simply as High Street, although this High Street is much unlike many others you'll find around the country more likely named for its high position in the town's geography. Like Wine Street, High Street was part of that development of industrial housing in the 18th century, initially designed to cater to workers in the wool industry. But how did Froome fare with its revival project once the cloth trade faded? Well, the old church hall here was built in 1850 as a Baptist chapel and schoolrooms, and it's an example of how Froome successfully managed to keep its economy going through the 19th century because while wool faded, much investment was poured into the town to draw in different industries, including facilities for locals, new modern roads like Bath Street, and the building of more workshops and factories that served a burgeoning gas industry, as well as iron and brass foundries. That being said, Froome never quite managed to recapture its true glory days of the medieval era, when it was more significant than even the city of Bath but it retained a varied industrial portfolio for the rest of the 19th and 20th centuries, before evolving into the flourishing and beautiful town that we know today. But while Froome is known as one of the best places to live in Britain today, one thing we haven't mentioned about the town is its unusually pronounced name. Said Froome, but spelled F-R-O-M-E, Froome's name has been catching people out for years. But where does this discrepancy between spelling and pronunciation come from? Well, as we look at the Grand Victorian Town Hall, the name Froome is related to the old Celtic word Frama, which refers to the brisk or fine flow of the river. Hence, both the river and the town became known as Froome. But unlike most places in England, which were later christened with Viking, Anglo-Saxon or Norman names, Froome's older Celtic origins mean that it's had a lot more time to evolve drifting further and further from a predictable pronunciation as the centuries have gone by. It's an intriguing quirk of this already quirky town, and as we look up at the grand Christchurch built in the 1810s, it's here that we've sadly reached the end of our tour around Froome. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you're looking forward to visiting Froome for yourself sometime soon.